Good morning, everybody. So uh, 2009 was one of those kind of banner years uh, in my life. It was one of those best of times, worst of time years. Uh, let, me, let me give you two uh, windows into, into what was going on in, inside of my life. Uh, 2009 was the second year of the Great Recession. And you remember it started in 2007. And uh, Newsweek magazine uh, said that Cape Coral, Florida was the first city into the Great Recession. And you remember that we were battling back and forth with Nevada, Las Vegas for the prestigious right to be named uh, the, the city with the highest foreclosure rate in America, right? It was a fun time. And uh, it was a, a challenging time to be a pastor and a leader uh, in the church. Um, and you can imagine all of the dynamics uh, that were at work there. Our people were losing their jobs and their homes. And yet at the same time, here's, uh, here's, the, here's the, the irony, at the same time, uh, in the three-year period, the first three years of the Great Recession, uh, Grace Church was the fastest growing church in our denomination. And so we had unbelievable ministry opportunities with diminished resources in a very challenged community. Uh, it became, uh, a, we became kind of a, a model across our denomination for churches. And uh, uh, as fate would have it, um, they decided to give me, the denomination decided to give me an award that really was an award that should have been given to the church. And I was named the distinguished evangelist in our church. Now, uh, at the same time that that was going on here at 13 Southeast 21st Place and all of the places we reach out into our community and to the world, what was happening down the street, just a mile down the street in my home, well, it was, it was the complete opposite. Uh, my wife and I just live a few miles from here, a mile or so from here, and we were living at the time with our youngest son, uh, Nathan, and my two parents in their 80s. And uh, in our home, what was going on there was, there was our dirty little secret. And our dirty little secret was that our youngest son, uh, Nathan, had taken up what I call the family business. I was a first-generation follower of Jesus, and most of the men in my family were uh, drug addicts and alcoholics. And Nathan, sadly, uh, took up that, that business. And, and it was a series of, of really bad things. There were arrests and there were um, uh, stints in jail. There was drug overdoses. There was suicide attempts. Uh, there was failed, failed attempts at, at rehab. And then... Uh, as things were going through 2009, uh, remember, it's, it's good here. It's really bad there. As things were going through 2009. Um, I started noticing in our home, uh, we're a pretty high trust home, and I started noticing in our home that some of my tools were missing from the garage. And then Cheryl started noticing that some of her jewelry was missing from her jewelry box. And it kind of hit a peak, a zenith, in mid-December of 2009. I was ironically moving money from savings to checking. I never checked my savings often, and I noticed that it was empty. And uh, our son had gotten our PIN number, and he was using it to buy opiates. Now, I've never committed assault. Never. But that night, I came as close as I ever have. And the person was my son. I had Nathan by the throat with my arm to pull back and venom coming out of my mouth. Can you catch the irony? Distinguished evangelist doing that undistinguished thing. Now I share the story with you with Nathan's permission but also for a point. And the truth is you can love Jesus and your relationships can be in the crapper. You, you can love Jesus and you can done, do un-Jesus-like things. B because relationships are hard and relationships are messy. Can I get a big yes from God's people? Yeah, yeah, they really are. 
And so throughout this series, um, we've been trying to drill home this single truth. If you don't get anything about this series, get this truth. It's on the screen. Here it is. Relationships are a discipleship issue. Say that with me. Relationships are a discipleship issue. Here's what I mean by that. I mean, you can't take your relationships with people and put it in a little Tupperware and put a seal on it and have that over here and then have the rest of your life over here, particularly your walk with God. You can't, you can't just kind of, well, I love Jesus, but then I'm going to leave the rest of my relationships in the ditch. If you, if you love Jesus, relationships are a discipleship issue. Let's take a, a little bit of a different look at relationships this morning. When we think about Jesus, even for people who aren't church-going folk, and you say Jesus to them, and who is Jesus, they will say something like this. Eventually, they'll get around to the fact that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose from the dead for the forgiveness of our sins. And so we'll get around to this forgiveness of sins, and, and eventually we'll get to the, the, the reality that he wants us to go to heaven, and we spend eternity with him. And so what we talk about is that Jesus died on the cross, he rose from the dead so that we could go to heaven. And we say that's the gospel, that's the good news. And I want to suggest to you that that's only half of the good news. That the other half of the good news, and it's in the pages of scripture, it's from the mouth of Jesus, the other half of the good news is that God came not just to get us to heaven, but to get heaven into us. We just finished singing, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in us, in me, on earth, as it is in heaven. And so God wants to get heaven in us as well. So uh, Pastor Taylor began this series five weeks ago, and he reminded us of a time that a religious leader came to Jesus and said, Jesus, what's the most important command? Now remember, Jews in that day followed 613 rules to obey God. Which is the most important, they asked. And Jesus took from two different spots in the Old Testament, and he said, it's to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Jesus said, basically, it's love God, love yourself, and, and love others. If you do this, he said, you're in good shape. You're in good shape. It's the greatest command. Now, uh, one time Jesus, in John chapter 10, is talking to his disciples, and he's trying to help them understand about loving God and loving self and loving others. And he said that he was the good shepherd. And he reminded us that as a good shepherd, the good shepherd, well, the good shepherd protects the sheep, not only from the bears and the, and the, and the tigers and the lions, but that but, but the, the good shepherd uh, protects the sheep from the sheep, from themselves. And newsflash, we're the sheep that need protecting Okay, so Jesus is the good shepherd. He wants to, to protect us. And he outs the religious leaders. And he says the religious leaders who want to impose all of these, these uh, laws on you, they've come to steal and kill and destroy. And then listen to what Jesus said. This is Pastor Wes's life first, John 10, 10 B. I came so that you might have life and have it what? Abundantly, abundantly. So, so Jesus is saying, listen, if you will love God and love yourself and love your neighbor, you can experience this abundant, full life, overflowing life. Now, Jesus was crystal clear that he wasn't saying that it means you'll be problem free. Remember, he said, in this life, you will have trials and tribulations. So it's not about a problem free life. He's saying that we can know fullness of life in spite of the circumstances. If you look at this graphic on the screen, it might help. Jesus said that we could have a full life, an abundant life, an overflowing life. And that is ours for the asking. But it involves our cooperation as we love God and love ourselves and love others. And, and it's not math. It's not one plus one plus one equals three. Uh, this, is, this is more like poetry. This is more like dance. This is more like art. Because, see, sometimes my walk with God is good, but then I'm bullying myself and being mean to Cheryl. And sometimes I'm, I'm doing all right with my self-care and, and, and I'm doing okay in my relational world, but I'm neglecting my relationship with God. There's ebbs and flows to this thing. But Jesus was clear that we need to love God and appropriately love ourselves so that we can love others. And when we do this, he says, we will experience the full life. And that's why, friends, this is contemporary for us. That's why you cannot say that you love Jesus and want to 
think that it's okay to kill somebody because their skin tone is different. Racism is a sin. It's a scourge on this planet. And we need a people who love God, not perfectly, who love themselves not perfectly so that they can love others not perfectly and experience this fullness of life. And the world is standing on tippy toe looking for a people who will do that. This is what we are called to do and this is who we are called to be. And this is a lifetime, lifelong journey. You don't graduate from this learning to love God, love self, and love others. Uh, this week I read in Renovare, in their blog, I read this great quote. I, I put it on the screen for you. The great Welch preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones said, our greatest need, listen to this, our greatest need is to become who we already are in Christ. That's good. True and beautiful, but how do we do that? A metaphor may help. One of the great metaphors of the kingdom of God, the seed. The oak is in the acorn. And you might say the acorn is becoming what it already is. The picture of a seed may help to illuminate the difference between new life and mature life. At the moment we decide to follow Jesus, we are given the seed of new life. It is everything real that didn't exist in us before. And while the miracle of growth is the work of God, listen to this, cooperating with God in that growth is up to who? It's up to us. It's up to me. It's up to you. So we have to cooperate with God. In the health of our relationship with God, with ourself, and, and with others. And I would dare say, you can draw a straight line in the fullness of life we're experiencing in all of those arenas based around our capacity and our willingness to cooperate with God in this growth. And so to help us, to help us understand this lifetime, lifelong work, we're going to end this series of Better Relationships with a case study on a famous Old Testament character by the name of David. Now, one of the things I love most about Scripture, and I want to say this again, is that the Scripture does not paint pictures of men and women who were sanitized and starched in their righteousness. They're stories of women and men who struggled to get it right, who were messy and who were raw, who sometimes got it right and often got it wrong. They were real, real women and men who wrestled with God, who wrestled with their own inner demons and with others. And uh, there, there's no one, I guess, in the, all of the Old Testament particularly that shows it more beautifully blaring than David. So David was just like you and me. He was the sum total of all of his experiences, the good and the bad, and yes, even the ugly. Now, we meet David first uh, when the current king, King Saul, is not doing real well in his monarchy. And Saul is disobeying God repeatedly, and the prophet Samuel, the prophet of the day, comes to Saul and says that he's going to lose his throne, and his family will lose their right to the throne. And then God sends the prophet Samuel on a recruiting mission and sends him to the little town of Bethlehem. And there he meets Jesse. And he's to go to Jesse's house, and he's told by God that there he will find the replacement for King Saul. So we read about the headhunting story in 1 Samuel chapter 16. So Jesse presents his seven sons, and the first one, his name was Eliab. They should have named him George, because in the Bible it says he was handsome. <laughs> he was quite the specimen. That's, that's not true. So, so, I mean, he was handsome. You get it. So God whispers to Samuel a cautionary word. He says, listen, I don't look the same way you look. I don't look at whether they're stunningly handsome or they're chiseled out of granite. He says, I look, I look at the heart. I, I look at the heart. And so, so he's supposed to look for the heart. And, and this is not a beauty contest, God says to him. This is not America's got talent contest. God looks at the heart. And so look at the commentary, verses 10 and 11, the beginning. So Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Seven. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen these. And so he asked Jesse, now listen to this. Are these all the sons you have? Now listen to dear old dad's answer. They're still the youngest. Jesse answered, he's tending the sheep. Now, it's interesting, this word youngest in the Hebrew, we read it, it says youngest, but this youngest in the Hebrew is the word katon, and it's the word that means insignificant. So not only 
when Samuel arrives and he says, bring me your sons, not only is David unnumbered, he has eight sons, not seven. Think David's going to need to talk to his therapist about that? And not only is he the eighth son that's unnumbered, he's not the Catone, his name is David. His own dad doesn't number him and he doesn't name him. He's going to have daddy issues. This is going to ding his self-worth. And they're right in front of dear old dad and his seven open mouth brothers. The prophet Samuel anoints David. Now here's the interesting thing in the story. He doesn't tell David nor the son nor the father why he's doing it. Only God and Samuel know. Because remember, crazy King Saul is still in charge. So David goes back to tending sheep. He doesn't leave the anointing session to the throne. And soon after this, the Israelites are in a battle with the Philistines. They're at a standstill, and the giant Goliath for 40 days is mocking the armies of God and God himself. He's taunting them, and David is sent by dear old dad on a food delivery to his brothers on the front line. And once he gets there, he sees the giant Goliath taunting and and he hears his taunts and and he volunteers to take on the giant and in a UFC showdown for the ages David refuses to wear the armor of the king and instead trusts his own life to a slingshot because he had seen God rescue him he cuts off the head of the Philistine with his own knife or his own sword and the Philistine's tuck tail now, three things ha- or two things happen as a result of this. They're found in 1 Samuel 18, uh, verses 7 through 9. When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was a time of celebration. This was their song, top 40. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. This made Saul very what? Angry. What's this, he said? They credit David with 10,000 and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The first thing that happened is David became famous, a celebrity. Just a sheep herder who loved to write poetry. And now all of a sudden, he's the giant slayer. And, And the second thing that happens is that Saul, the king, becomes jealous. And yet, As the crowds are singing this, and as Saul's filled with jealous rage, all that David wants to do is serve his king. He loves his king. Saul plots to kill David. And so David does what any person would do. He goes into hiding, and he lives on the run. Now fast forward with me. A long time, David is living as a refugee, fearing for his life. And repeatedly, Saul is trying to hunt him down and to kill him. And yet all the time, David stays loyal. He refuses to kill the Lord's anointed. Can I pause for a second? Would you agree with me that this was a bad relationship for David? And yet all of us have bad relationships. Now, fast forward with me even more. Now, Saul dies in battle. He loses his throne. His kids lose the throne. And David indeed is enthroned as the king. So you'd think a guy that's seen God carry him through all of this. Well, he'd get it figured out in his relationship with God himself and others. He had seen God rescue him time and time again. You think he'd have relationships figured out, but you'd be wrong. And here's the truth that we learned just from this, this point. That yesterday's miracle is not enough for today's challenges. You see, just like we need to have a first-hand faith, our own faith, we also need an up-to-date faith. And When I came into the office this morning... Uh, My computer had gone through an update. I need my faith to stay updated. And so did did David. You see, because the rest of the David story is filled with all kinds of relational challenges. I'll just lift up two. The first one is the most famous one. It's he's the king. He's in charge. Life is good. And in the time of the year that kings are supposed to go out to war, he stayed home. He saw a woman that he wanted that was not his wife. He took her, he impregnated her, he had her husband killed, and then he covered it up. And then the prophet Nathan, a new prophet, 
The prophet Nathan comes and he sticks his bony finger in the center of David's chest and says, you are the man right there in the pages of Holy Scripture. Is this guy that's supposed to love God, this guy gets it wrong. What if your worst failure is not behind you, but in front of you? He gets it wrong. Now, he beautifully repents. Read Psalm 51. He beautifully repents. Now, fast forward with me to one other story. A little bit later, life is good. He's an older king now. Things should be settled. And he gets sideways with his son Abimelech. And David was negligent. You can see it in the pages of Scripture. He was negligent in nurturing his own son. And Abimelech decides he wants to be the king And what does dad do? Dad tucks tail and runs, and he goes back to those same caves that he had lived in as a kid. He's living on repeat, fearing for his life. Now, here's the interesting thing. Samuel in the Old Testament and Paul in the New Testament called David a man after God's own heart. And yet he seemed to get it so wrong in his relational life. Time after time, it was almost always complicated. How is it? You see, when you do a case study of David in the Old Testament, there is one thing we've not said. That when David got it wrong, he'd always run to God to make it right. So here's the the principle we want you to take home. It's on the screen. Why don't you say this with me? No matter what, trust God always. Say it again. No matter what, trust God always. You see, what made David a man after God's heart was not his perfect relationship with God, with himself, or with others. Like all of us, he messed up. He messed up regularly, and David messed up sometimes royally. But what made David a man after God's own heart was David always ran back to God. And you see this best described uh, not in the narratives in 1 Samuel, but you see it best described in about the center of your Bible in his prayers and his songs that he wrote in the book of Psalms. Uh, They're just filled with Uh, David's prayers that he would bring before God because no matter what he was going through, he just seemed to have this capacity to always bring it to the only one on the the universe who can fix it, and that's God. Uh, We're going to look at one out of Psalm 42, just a few verses. And David, this is when he was a young man, my favorite cave in all of the Bible, the cave of Adullam. And this is where David ran to hide by himself alone, And he was fearing for his life from the crazy king. And look at Psalm 42, just a few verses, verses 5 through 7. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. I cry to you, O Lord. I say you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am brought very low. Save me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. See, David's in a very literal low place. He's he's in a cave right here. And he calls this cave where he's fearing for his life. He calls this cave a prison. Have you ever had your relational life get so twisted, so broken, that you felt you were imprisoned. I know that I have. That's where I was living in that undistinguished moment when I had my fist raised back in 2009. What was behind it all is that I was imprisoned in my own fear. I was imprisoned in anger. And David helps us here. In this prayer, he says this. It's really simple. He says, God, you are my refuge. You are the only one I can turn to. Refuge is a place of protection. It's a place of peace. And listen to me, friends. Only God, only God can turn a prison into a place of refuge. But you have to let him. 
It is this place of protection. It's this, it's this place of peace. And, and David, listen to me. When you read the whole Psalm 142, he doesn't whitewash his circumstances in this prayer. Read the whole thing. He starts to name ta- names, but he also names the name of his rescuer and his redeemer. He laments deeply, but David equally trusts God deeply. He brings his conflict to God. So, some of you know that Pastor Wes's dad The Reverend Dr. J. Howard Olds was my mentor. He was a masterful preacher, and he suffered greatly through a dozen years of cancer. And it wasn't until this week when I did the math that I realized that my sweet mentor died at the age that I am today, 62. He died of cancer. And once, when he was in the midst of his cancer, he described his journey this way. He said, some valleys are too high to go over. Too deep to tunnel under and too wide to go around. The only choice is to go through the valley. And there's some of us here today, I dare say there's all of us in this room and online today that have at least one relationship that's in the valley. So I want to invite the band to come up as we begin to close. And I want to invite you to go with me uh, in my journey back to that day in 2000. And nine. That day where I had no escape, that day when I was in my own cave of Adullam, when I was facing my fears that my son was going to die, and my anger at him, and the hopelessness of the situation, that Cheryl and I could not fix this. I had to face the reality that my rescue for my son and his addiction was not in my hands, but it was in the hands of God. And in the days and years to follow, I had to pray David's prayer. When I didn't know whether he was going to survive, I had to pray, Lord, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. I had to pray it over and over again. You see, I had to ask the only one who could transform my prison of fears into a refuge of faith. And I had to build around me a a group of people who could help me walk through it. And so we re-engaged our relationship with our therapist. And we entered into the very recovery that we had started a few decades before. I got a spiritual director. And I got a group of men around me who love me but are not impressed by me. So that they could hold me accountable. And it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen overnight. But by the grace of God. God turned our dark prison into a place of refuge. And my sweet boy, he's he's alive. He's four and a half years sober. And we have this beautiful, yeah. We have this beautiful, amazing friendship. He calls me every few days just to say, Daddy, I love you. I never dreamed that would happen. Now, all morning I've been talking to parents, one at the last hour, who had a son named Nathan, who died of an overdose. Their story is not like our story. And all I could say to them is, Nathan's story, our Nathan's story is not done either. I don't know what it holds. I would tell you that every time the phone rings, my heart stops still. Still. And then I told him through tears. I said, I guess you only have two choices in life. Try to figure it out yourself. Or bring it to God. There's an Irish poet and preacher who wrote a beautiful hymn. Maybe you grew up singing it. I'd like to invite you to hear it in a different way. Are we weak? And heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care, precious Jesus, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise and forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace, peace, refuge. So I want to invite you to stand with me this morning and think of that one relationship 
Maybe it's two, maybe it's five. And I want to invite you this morning uh, to simply take it to the Lord in prayer. So would you close your eyes? For me, it's helpful just to hold my hands out. Would you simply pray over that relationship? God, you are my refuge. Would you say that with me? God, you are my refuge. Would you say it again? God, you are my refuge. One more time. God, you are my refuge. Yeah. So, Father, Casey reminded us that you're not only the creator, but you are a good, good God. And God, you are our only refuge. Only you can turn prisons of fear and anger and heartache and disappointment and bitterness and rage. Only you can turn those kinds of prisons into places of refuge. Lord, we can't figure it all out ourselves. Relationships are complicated and they're messy. And this morning, Lord, we just lay before you all of our relationships. We name before you this one or two or six relationships right now that are hard. And we ask you, Lord Jesus, to be our refuge, to be our peace. We pray this. In Jesus' name, and everybody agreeing said, amen, amen. So I'm going to ask the worship team to lead us in singing and declaring the truth that our Lord is a way maker, that he's a miracle worker, and that he can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. The altar is open. If you want to come and pray, please do. Make your seat a place of prayer where you are at home, a place of prayer. They're putting the prompts up for you. If you want somebody to pray with you, just lift a hand. One of us will be glad to do that. Let's sing together.